I'm Mark Hamlet. I'm provost here at Carnegie Mellon, and it's a delight to welcome you to, I think this is our fourth uh, Innovators Forum over the past uh, two or three years. And these are special occasions for us here at Carnegie Mellon where we get the opportunity to get to talk to and hear from some of the most uh, creative uh, entrepreneurs uh, of, of our time. And uh, today, we're very, very privileged to have Vinod Kosla, who is uh, an extraordinarily accomplished, creative uh, entrepreneur and a company creator and venture capitalist and person impacting the world in extraordinary ways. I know you know a lot about Vinod's accomplishments, but let me just remind you that among the many is he's a alum from Carnegie Mellon, having received a master's in biomedical engineering um, after his uh, coming to the US from uh, IIT Delhi, I believe and a uh, founder of Daisy Systems, and then founding CEO of Sun Microsystems, which the uh, pioneering work in all that Sun did in open systems and risk processors and, and the like. One of our other alums, uh, Andy Bechtelsheim, and a friend of Vinod, has said of him, Vinod is a visionary who likes to make big bets on ideas that can really change the world. And we are delighted that he's with us. I'm going to ask him to come up here to the stage. And in fact, Vinod, you can come on up and. Thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, it's I'm great to be here. I'm going to ask a few questions just to get the ball rolling, but uh, we will be sure to have time for you to be part of this discussion as well, because the format is intentionally informal. We want this to be uh, a back and forth. And Vinod has indicated that he's open for all questions, that this is a to be a, a, an, an, an open and in, interesting discussion. Yeah, don't so, be polite. <laughs> be a little polite. <laughs> uh, so, Vinod, I thought I would uh, start. You know, somebody mentioned or read something in the context of the way you go about in terms of picking people and in, t in terms of picking projects and businesses, and that you have liked to say that you invest in people as much as the initial clever business idea. How do you evaluate entrepreneurs who come to you and want to get your support? Um, let me, you know, it's, it's funny people laugh when I say don't be polite, but I actually mean it. Um, it's an essential quality of entrepreneurs to, to challenge things, maybe even disrespect authority. Um, you know, when, when my kids were five, I sort of probably was the main guy who threw food at them <laughs> because they were too well behaved. Uh, I had the reverse problem. My kids were like a little too well, well, well behaved. So my daughter just had her 25th birthday and we were at a party at, rest, at a restaurant with all her friends. And she was telling me over the weekend that my Friends think you're really cool because I actually threw some food at some of our <laughs> friends. Uh, and these are 25-year-olds. Um, and they thought it was cool. I, I think shaking things up is an essential part of entrepreneurship in sort of almost challenging, disrespecting authority, not, not being too conf confirming are essential parts of entrepreneurship. The other piece that I find is religion's really important. 
religion in whatever you want to do. Uh, most people don't know this, but uh, this is an interesting fact. Uh, most of you have probably heard of the God gene um, that makes people more religious. Uh, turns out that applies not only to religions like Christianity, it applies equally to religion about entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a book called On Being Certain, When You're Wrong. Why do you have such strong beliefs about being certain when you're wrong? The gene is common between really religious people who believe in their religion and entrepreneurs who believe in their <laughs> business plan. It's the same gene. Written by a neuroscientist, I forget his name, really good book. Um, so passion about what you want to do is an essential part to me about uh, being a good entrepreneur, being a little bit of a troll, um, a little bit of a disrespect. Uh, I have a lot of disrespect for authority and conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for expert opinion, mm -hmm. uh, we, I'd love to talk about expert opinion. You didn't ask me, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what do you think about expert opinion? <laughs> good question. Um, Turns out, one of the reasons to be disrespectful for authority and conventional wisdom is ex expert opinion doesn't, isn't very good. Uh, first, I'll give you anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, Martin Luther King said, human salvation lies in the hands of the socially maladjusted. Uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw said, uh, something similar. He said, um, I, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, that, uh, but <clears throat> it'll come to me. But this most rigorous study of expert opinion, and there's obviously lots of knowledgeable professors who have expert opinions in their domains, this is a bad thing to say at a place like CMU. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but Professor Tetlock at UC Berkeley formally studied uh, expert opinion, and he took 28,000 forecasts and across a number of domains, from re reading brain imaging scans to what will happen in China, or what will happen to the Soviet Union, to how will GDP growth happen, uh, what will it be next quarter, um, and he found across 28,000 forecasts, a 20-year study, about 250 experts followed closely that the rough accuracy was the same as dot throwing monkeys. <laughs> uh, for those of you statistically inclined, read his book called Expert Political Judgment. Those of you who want just a fun Sunday read, the same data is captured in a book called Future Babel. And Future Babel is exactly the essence of entrepreneurship. If what expert opinion is, is Babel, which I truly believe, and Karl Marx said, when the train of history hits a curve, the intellectuals fall off. We <laughs> see a lot of intellectuals among the experts in that universities. Mm -hmm. um, not a fan of Karl Marx, but uh, true fan of capitalism, but I think there's real truth. Um, so that's my view of expert opinion. Uh, if we can be so wrong and take a rigorous, I'll give you my favorite example, a rigorous thing like medical studies on whether you should take Lipitor or a statin if you, have, if you want to lower your cholesterol. And does it impact heart disease? Professor Ayan it is, who's at the Stanford School of Medicine, um, I followed him for years when he was in Greece, made the following statement. He's the world's expert on medical studies. So he studies medical studies. Mm -hmm. He said, any given study that is accepted today is more likely to be wrong than right. Now think about that. All of medicine mm -hmm. is based on these studies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and most expert opinion is wrong. You know, go to your family doctor. If you have little kids and they have very high temperature, ask them if you should, what you should do. What the first mm -hmm. thing they say, take some Tylenol or aspirin, reduce the fever. Turns out that piece of expert opinion has never been tested 
except once. And the one time it was tested, it was tested in the uh, uh, ICU unit of the hospital at University of Miami among 80 some patients, half of them controls. And the death rate among kids in the ICU where they were doing the practice of reducing fever was so high they discontinued the study on ethical grounds. So a simple fact like doctors telling you reduce the temperature can be wrong. And that's why Dr. I and it is. And so back full circle, if you're an entrepreneur, you want innovation, ignore everything you know about what's expected to happen. Sounds like good advice, I guess. <laughs> I know you have had such a passion and commitment and engagement in uh, uh, energy and environment, and I want to kind of raise one or two questions to take, take advantage of all, all that you've done and your thinking in the area. You know, there's, a, particularly in this area, in, in western Pennsylvania with uh, 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 shale gas and so forth, and the predictions by some experts uh, uh, on the possibility of uh, the U.S. becoming uh, energy sufficient or whatever. And I guess my question is whether or not that notion of U.S. energy sufficiency is even the, the right way to think about energy policy and what you think lies ahead. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little bit unfair because we're sort of in the midst of that uh, uh, shale yeah. area. But So... Um let me go back to this issue of expert opinion. Okay. There is clearly these experts who have opinions. But if you go back to 2008, mm -hmm. not very long ago, five years ago, summer of 2008, you asked any expert five years ago would say there's going to be a shortage of natural gas in the United States. Mm -hmm. The, one of the largest areas of investment in natural gas was building LNG terminals to import yeah, natural gas right. five years ago. And so in a typical LNG project, it takes somewhere between seven to ten years mm -hmm. to build it. Opinion can change within five years. None of those experts are now accountable. Mm -hmm. right? They wrote their papers, moved on. Um, but they were dramatically wrong in predicting natural gas trajectory. Mm -hmm. I contend that it's the same is true going forward. Five years from now, if one technology showed up, conversion of natural gas to liquid fuels, one little technology, all those assumptions would be wrong again, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the point is, Technology changes cause economic disruption. And you can, the, what the experts do is what Karl Marx said, extrapolate the past, mm -hmm. right? And when that train of history hits a curve, there's a change in technology, all those assumptions are wrong. So look, I can be a weather forecasting expert uh, with about 75 to 80 percent ac accuracy in most places by saying the weather tomorrow is going to be the same as the weather today. So extrapolating the past works. The question is, opinions only matter if they change what a simplistic model can do. And there's been enough studies to say most expert opinion can be improved upon by building the sim most simplistic of models like in weather forecasting. So you can extrapolate the past, shale gas is an example, or what I like to say is you can invent the future you want, and that's what innovators do. Forget what others believe, I'm gonna change the planet with some innovation and change the course. So if you came up with one little technology to take natural gas and turn it into liquid fuels interchangeable with oil, suddenly natural gas everywhere in the world would be priced like oil is and be an international commodity and you wouldn't be, this is a US solution and that's a solution in Europe mm -hmm. or Russia. You'd say it's an international commodity. I think it's very likely to happen. In fact, we have one company doing just that. Mm -hmm. take the abundant shale gas and convert it into liquid fuels. 
two years, three years ago, they were working on converting biomass into liquid fuels, and they said, a lot easier and a lot cheaper to take natural gas and convert it into liquid fuels, and suddenly, five years from now, the experts will be saying something else. Um, I'll make a general comment about this. Used to be, and a lot of CMU people are engineers, in, engineers, in engineering, we were taught to optimize something, optimize cost, optimize performance, more throughput, more transactions per second in a database, uh, lower cost engines, more efficient engines. I actually think what needs to be done where education needs to change for engineers and scientists is to learn to optimize for agility and adaptability. The world is changing faster and faster. At some point, you say, there's no way to predict what the world will do. And I always assume I have no way of predicting where the world will go. I'm just going to be very adaptable and agile. Which uh, brings me to this related topic. I hate titles like energy visionary. Um, I think the only thing I'm visionary about is knowing I don't have a clue. <laughs> I think where, where other people make mistakes is to pretend they know where we're going. But in almost every area, most of the really interesting things happen because um, you, you discover it, you invent it, you make it happen not because it was predicted. Mm -hmm. And so the notion of vision is really a wrong notion. Mm -hmm. I like to say I screw up more often and faster than most people. I fail more than most people. And I fundamentally say my willingness to fail is the only thing that gives me an ability to succeed. Think about it. Unless I was willing to fail, I wouldn't take any risks. Then I'd be in the realm of extrapolate the past, do what experts tell you, what, what's happening next. My willingness to try high-risk things is what gives me the ability to do unusual things because I'm trying them. Yeah. You know, it's sort of called uh, you can fail and try or fail to try, <laughs> right? Pick. And most people fail to try instead of trying and failing. I like trying and failing. I like to say I don't mind failing. In fact, people criticize me for saying I'll invest in projects that have a 90% chance of failure. But use the probability of failure so much mm -hmm. that the consequences of success are inconsequential. So you can take, I'm much more in the Nassim Taleb camp as a financial investor, buy an option on something that has large impact and small cost to failing. Try lots of little things, small cost to failing, high upside when you succeed. That's not about vision, it's about premature confidence, maybe uh, arrogance, it's about the things that are key to innovation and innovators. So, so we're, we're, we're in a framework, as you've set forth, where it's very hard to predict what's going to uh, come to be. Uh, the willingness to take risks and to explore. But on the other hand, if you're, say, President Obama, or if you're at a national policy level, the policies that go into place, so something has to sort of be chosen. I know that you have had uh, many opportunities on the national stage. I recall you were here a couple of years ago with President Obama, in fact, discussing some of these issues, inclu including energy issues. In, in terms of national policy, take something like a, like a carbon tax, for, for instance. There you don't know what it's going to lead specifically, but, but, but you are needing to set a policy, and, mo and moreover, you probably want to make that policy, whatever it is, as clear and as precise so people sort of sort of have a sense of what, of what they're dealing with. What, what would your thoughts be with regard either specifically to something like a carbon tax or cap and trade, as the case may be, or other areas of that you know, sort? Let me answer that question more generally. Uh, about 18 months ago, I was invited to speak to 
the, by the Secretary of the Navy to talk to the Navy. Uh, energy is a major global mm -hmm. issue. Energy is a major driver of the Navy and what they can and can't do. If you're in the middle of the ocean and can't get fuel, you've you got a problem. Um, so they asked me, there's a hundred, roughly 150 admirals in the Navy. They were having a meeting planning for Navy 2040. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to open this sort of conference they were having for just their admirals. Uh, now think about the problem. You have to plan the Navy. You can't build an uh, aircraft no. carrier in less than 15 years. You, if you have research, it's even longer to first design new capability, like for the new Joint Strike Force fighter. Right. So what do you do? Huh? And, but I started by asking, this was 2011, I said, in the year 2000, what was the Navy's mission? Top three missions. Right? Turned out China didn't figure in the mission. We forget that China was not politically considered important. Japan was the other economic powerhouse. Right? Not that long ago. And so I said, if your mission has changed, right? there was no 9-11, there was no Al-Qaeda, there was a very different world for the Navy. And I said, if you didn't know what your mission was in 2000, for what would be important in 2011, 2012, how can you plan 2040? And they now have a new set of missions. I call that the pretense of knowing. You pretend you know something that you know, no. You're much, so the question was then, after I gave my talk about this baloney about planning the Navy for 2040, one of the admirals asked me, so what should we do? My answer was, if you know you don't know, you do different things than pretending here's the three scenarios you have to plan for. And their response was, the world's changing really rapidly, so instead of three scenarios, let's plan the Navy for five scenarios. And I said, if you did 15, you still wouldn't predict Osama bin Laden and one guy causing that much change in global politics. And if you suddenly discovered shale gas and energy wasn't a big issue, suddenly your mission changes. It's no longer protecting the sea lanes. By the way, just protecting the oil lanes in the last 25, 30 years, we've spent $7 trillion, which is really a subsidy to the oil industry because we're doing their transportation insurance for them. Um, so when you think about it this way, you engineer these systems to be adaptive and agile, which is a very different task than taking any mission, whether it's one or five, and optimizing for them. And Don Rumsfeld, after fighting the Iraq war, essentially said, we no longer need traditional defense, which upset a lot of defense people. We need agility for the unknown unknown. I think that was his famous line. I think whether you're building an engineering system, a computer system. I mean, imagine computing. Workloads have changed. I know the head of the computer science departments here. Workloads have changed so dramatically. Big data, Hadoop, all that. Not one piece of architectural change has happened to accommodate those. And I can't find a place doing computer architecture for these new loads. And so somebody asked me, so what would you do? And they sort of said, here's the new architecture. I said, no, wrong approach. That, that's new architecture if you assume Hadoop is your big data computing environment mm -hmm. and big data revolves around Hadoop. But almost certainly in five years, nobody will be talking about Hadoop as a big data computing environment. Let's build an adaptable system. I said, why don't we instrument the device to reconfigure some things every minute, some things every hour, some things every day, and some things once a month? Huh? Now, nobody's doing that in computer science that I know of, that I've been able to find. 
So adaptability and agility in the face of rate of change become the most important things to optimize for. Makes sense. I want to take advantage of being the uh, moderator to ask one more question, but then I'm going to also hope there'll be, uh, won't keep hogging all the questions here and turn it over to I some of the audience. I apologize. I talked too long. No, 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 no. But I do want to get one, one other one in. So we're very excited. We ha are uh, opening up a major um, uh, energy institute, the Scott Institute. Uh, I know you've been involved with uh, some of the uh, discussions that we've had the opportunity uh, to have as we think through. Uh, in fact, we're even more pleased. We received not only the generous gift from, from the Scots, but $30 million. Just this past week, we were able to announce from the Richard King Mellon Foundation I know that one of the things that we would say that we are particularly focused on as, a, as an area where we think we can bring something to the uh, debates and policies on, on energy and, uh, and, and environment has to do with sort of systems of systems, sort of systems of analysis, but probably taken one step up. And I know you know a lot about what we sort of have as a backbone in that, in that regard. But would you have any advice for us? It's a kind of a selfish CMU-centric question, but do you have any advice for us on how you think we should prioritize, you know, we're an academic uh, uh, setting, this new energy institute. It's not that we don't have lots of things now, but now that we're able to kind of contemplate putting them into, into a package, yeah. how, what, what, what are things that would come to so, mind? The things that come to mind are generally the plans I've seen are too linear. And the world is a nonlinear place. Uh, at the one end, the chemists are doing chemistry and the chemical engineers are doing chemical engineering and the physicists are doing their thing. Um, diverse interacting systems result in much better outcomes. Uh, to the point where about 10, 12 years ago when I took a sabbatical from investing, I sent it, spent it, uh, I was, became a postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute oh. doing complex systems theory. My kids loved it, by the way, because I'd, I was sold on my math. I had to get a math PhD from Stanford to come tutor me for six months to brush up my math <laughs> so I could actually go build complex systems models. Um, I think complexity isn't included enough. Mm -hmm. And nonlinear effects from com come from complex interactions. I mentioned medical study. One of the causal reasons they're wrong is if I am a drug company and I'm doing a diabetic drug, right, I really don't care about improving the world. I care about getting my drug approved. So what do I do? Uh, I get a population that's high likelihood to not have complexity in it. So why are clinical trials so hard? Because they select somebody who has high blood sugar but doesn't have hypertension. They don't have cardiac disease. They might not have thyroid disease. Turns out they might not have uh, mental illness. Turns out depression and diabetes of comorbidities. Um, so they get very high approval rates because this person's taking one drug, only theirs, yeah. and the trial passes. In real life, most of the people who have diabetes taking a drug for depression, for cardiac disease, for hypertension, and complex interactions mm -hmm. start to happen. That's why most studies are more likely to be wrong than right which it just boggles my mind that we don't do something about this fundamental fact. Every piece of medicine, we, every pill we take is based on studies that are more likely to be wrong than right. It just makes me shiver. Um, so complex systems are really important. Mm -hmm. um, this morning we were talking about electric car batteries a little bit. And I said, do you realize electric car batteries and whether they're viable or not are impacted much more, not as much, but much more by whether machine learning and robotic autonomous drivers and driverless cars become popular mm -hmm. than by improvements in lithium ion chemistry. I 
will challenge anybody to challenge me on the following fact. Any improvement in lithium-ion chemistry, which is the assumption now on how batteries will go, and another assumption of experts I don't believe, almost certainly the solution will not be lithium-ion, in my view. But any improvement in chemistry in lithium-ion is likely to be less consequential to electric cars than autonomous mm -hmm. uh, dr driverless cars. Why? For the simple reason. If you had an autonomous car, you could get a car to drive 10 times as much per year. If you can amortize it 10 times faster, you can't get a 10x improvement in lithium-ion economics. You can get a 10x improvement in autonomous vehicles driving the car so you get 100,000 miles per year instead of 10,000 miles per year per car. And asset use, that's what I mean by complex systems. So I think that's very that important. Sense. At the other extreme, almost all the efforts I've seen, I've seldom seen computational physics, computational biology, computational material science, computational fluid dynamics used enough. Mm -hmm. So interactions across disciplines and more fundamental science is key to energy than incremental improvements in what we know. Great. So those are two opposite ends. One is complex systems interactions, and the other is really more fundamental science. Seems very Everything good. in the middle is mostly inconsequential. Very, very good advice. Now, we're sitting here, and there's all these lights, and so I don't know that see out quite so well, but I want to turn it over to questions from the audience, and if I kind of squint, you, you, you'll know why. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I, I do see, okay, right, right there. Hi. <coughs> so, Maybe you can say also who, who you are and where you're sure. from. Sure. I'm a uh, senior uh, math major, um, Elliot. Given, given your uh, uh, conjecture that you should challenge uh, the status quo very often. How does that affect how industry and academia should interact like in the context of entrepreneurship? Right? So if you're an entrepreneur and you're interested in working with a professor or you're an academic and you're interested in taking something that you've uh, discovered and bring into industry, how exactly, uh, given that you are sort of the status quo, how does that uh, Change. So, um, you know, Nassim Taleb would say, don't go to college, right? His, his book, new book, Anti-Fragile, is way more important than most people realize. There's some fundamental ideas, and they speak, it's called Anti-Fragile for a reason. He argues that we build overly engineered systems, and what we're really doing is increasing fragility. And in error-prone systems, you get more robustness, more maturity. And it doesn't matter whether it's in financial systems, in the financial crisis, was, and uh, he had essentially talked about it happening before it happened, so he's one of the few people I respect. You build robustness into the systems. He would argue that doing is more important than learning, at least credentialing. Um, I'm not quite a believer in that, but I do believe in mixing learning and doing at the same time is much more important, and it changes what you learn and what you retain and how you learn. Uh, I'll give you an example in our own field. There was a guy who used to work for me, um, and we have a rule when young guys join our venture firm, Coastal Ventures, they cannot stay there too long. That means there's no career path to become an investor by joining us, uh, which is pretty controversial. But he was with us for three years, and then he did his own startup and started things. And he said to me a year later, he said, I heard you speak, advise entrepreneurs for three years. And he said, I interpreted them very differently than I do now, now that I'm an entrepreneur. So the same teaching was, you know, in, in teaching, it's not what's the message that's sent that's important, it's the message that's received. 
we assume message sent is message received, but that's not true. Mostly learning is worse than the game of telephone, whisper <laughs> telephone. Message received is seldom like the message sent, and the message received can change based on what you're doing, how you're interacting, how much in real life. So I think interaction is much more important. Uh, I'll try and keep my answers shorter, but uh, I, I think it's pretty important. I think it's very relevant for what we strive to and hopefully can strive perhaps even further in trying to make real world problem solving and learning and doing and making kind of part of the, part, part of and, the package. And you look, in some departments, it's much easier to do. In computer science, it's much easier to hack together a website. Uh, mm -hmm. And my son's a sophomore in computer science at Stanford, and you know, much easier. My daughter's uh, a junior in civil engineering. It's much more, much harder yeah. to be as hands-on, right, and interactive. So it does depend. My oldest daughter did design, which is a mechanical engineering discipline mm -hmm. at Stanford, so you have to meet. And there was easy to be mm -hmm. hands-on. You could study about materials, but when you did design and then tried material science and needed to know about properties of materials, your view of both design changed and material science changed. We, I think we got a good sense walking in through the hall here of all yep. the, 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 the hands-on, I think, in, in the, uh, it must have been the art students. Yes, uh-huh. By, by the way, oh. uh, being in the CFA, uh, I'm against liberal arts education in undergraduate. I think it's the worst thing you can do. First, every engineer should get enough liberal arts education. But the flip is true. I wouldn't consider anybody educated if they didn't have any computer science, science, engineering education. You are not. Our view of liberal education is what came over from England in the 1800s. It's silly to think that a liberal science major doesn't need to know computer science. We have this silly language requirement in high schools and colleges. The most important language is programming, not French. <laughs> if I had to pick between the two, which one would you pick? <laughs> um, I, I was proud of my daughter. Stanford has a language requirement. She, she decided to do sign language, which is spend the least time wasting, least time, wasting your time, learning something that's a historical anomaly. Yeah. So um, I think, now if you want to stand, study French literature, only time, or fine arts, or the cello, only time it's important is in a graduate program. Right? Basic education should be the same for everybody. Our society has become so knowledge-based that we should stop extending the past. You know, in the past we said everybody should get a high school education and then do what they think. Well, that benchmark has since moved to basic education where you understand how your car works, how engines work, as much as how Shakespeare works. In fact, I'd venture to say Shakespeare is not as important as knowing how your thermostat works, which I find 95% of people on the planet still don't know how to operate a simple <laughs> thermostat intelligently on, on their wall. So the nature of education has to change what's essential. Nobody should graduate from CMU without being able to read every article in The Economist every yeah, week. I agree with that. You can't do social science and psychology till you know statistics. Otherwise, you get stupid social science, which most of social science is things that are not validated or validatable or provable. So if you don't know statistics, don't tell me you're doing psychology. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> if you know statistics, then I'm really interested in what you can tell me about behavioral science. In fact, there's no engineer who should graduate without multiple courses in human behavior and psychology or economics, really important, but based on real, provable, repeatable facts. Sorry, that's a B for mine. <laughs> Whoever's from modern languages, we're going to add Java and C++. Well, so, so you bring up an important <laughs> issue. 
you shouldn't be able to do language without doing linguistics. Absolutely. I mean, linguistics should be an essential part of every curriculum, whether you're doing material science or you're doing um, music. Or the theory of music should be really an essential part. To me, those are the essentials of learning how to learn well, and think and capabilities. I, actually, I think that you know, he, here are like our Language Technology Institute, which is basically a department in computer science, but it had its roots in linguistics, philosophy, yeah. and English. Philosophy should be essential, linguistics should be essential, but not the easy parts of those, mm -hmm. right? Literature you can do all day long on your own if you're a smart, educated person. <laughs> huh? Jane Austen is not as important as most of the things. The structure of language, the structure of music, all really important. Yeah. So people overinterpret, but the traditional notion of liberal arts should be abolished, and anybody wasting 250 grand of their parents' money to get a degree like that, <laughs> and then be unemployable. I got into a controversy recently because there was a guy who did a Yale program and then tweeted, the only job I can get is bartending. And I said, that's the courses you took and wasted the privilege of being able to go to Yale and spend 250 grand of your parents' money, and you forgot the obligation you had to use it well. Do you know this uh, movie, Men in Black, where you take the little thing and go bink, bink, and you'll forget all this on, on your way out the door? When you, you won't remember any of what, uh, what, we just, what, what we've just discussed. <laughs> Um, let's see, there was, actually, there's, I think there's, 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 I have strong views on everything. Yeah, I think you, that was where I left things, yeah. I forgot my question. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm only kidding. I'm Alan Rosenblum, a physician researcher, former life I was in ICU, and I never uh, treated infectious fever. There are, it's 5,000 years ago, the Chinese have a symbol for fever, blah, blah, blah. We know it clears infection. Anyway, my question is... Um, Navigating the minefield of this. Could you speak yeah, into the mic? Hit, we yeah. hear. Navigating the minefield of entrepreneurship, there's a whole bunch of icebergs. And one that really disturbs me is, uh, given, I'll give you two short examples. One I learned over here at the extra, uh, Electric Garage. Somewhere around 94, um, Toyota had an uh, electric car. The battery, the guy who invented the battery, this is what they told me over there, so I'm quoting them, sold it to GE, figuring that GE would mass produce it, et cetera. GE then looked around like any company, how can we make the most money off of this? Well, they decided to make the most money off of it by selling it to Shell Oil. You know what happened? Shell sued Toyota for 70 million for, yep, okay, that's example one. Example two, I personally know a, a group that invented a beautiful handheld. Um, a what? A beautiful handheld uh, flow cytometer and uh, it gets CD4 levels, very important in treating HIV. And this thing, you can't have a sheath flow, so they use sound focusing. Brilliant design. Bought, uh, so the VCs wanted their money back and they said, okay, we're going to sell this off to Invitrogen. The scientists, this is in New Mexico. Were, well, let's keep the question short. Let me answer that. Yeah, anyway, Invitrogen bought it and killed it, and that was their plan all along. So how can you prevent your best intention and your great invention from just being bought and killed? Yeah, so th this is a great question for a forum on innovation. A uh, couple of things. One of the realities of life is not every good idea gets into the market. And there's plenty, the fundamental notion of innovation implies change. Change implies disruption. And most of existing society benefits from not changing things, not disrupting things. Mm -hmm. right? There's always an interest in keeping things the way they are. The oil companies don't want, want biofuels or electric cars. Um, that GE doesn't want to interrupt this gas tur combined cycle gas turbine business. Uh, so there's most of the established interest is in not changing things. Uh, there's, again, expert opinion that what you ought to do if you want to scale something is go to the large companies. Um, I was talking to the g gentleman uh, in robotics doing the driverless car at CMU last night briefly. Got in late, 
he was willing to meet late at night. Um, and he said, you know, we're working with General Motors. And I said, oh, no. Um, almost a guarantee of failure, right? Um, then, the, first, they have no interest in disrupting cars. If you have a driverless car, you'll need fewer of them. GE won't do that. Uh, General Electric, won't, uh, General Motors won't do that. Right? The other is, they have a good business, and everybody there is on a career path. And career paths have asymmetric benefits. If you succeed, you get a minor benefit. If you fail, it's permanently on your record. So it discourages this notion I talked about, failure. Big companies don't like to fail, which means they take only incremental risks. No large innovation has come from big companies. Did Toyota or General Motors do the electric car, or did Tesla? Did NBC do media change, or did Google? Did Walmart do retailing change, or Amazon? I could go on and on and on. I've really never seen a big company innovate, or be able to effectively bring innovation to market. Why? Because they over plan it. They think they can predict the future when all you can do is try little things, fail, pivot left, pivot right, um, use every failure to learn, adapt, and change. And that's not a comfortable thing in a large company, and that's why all large projects fail. So innovation doesn't start from big companies, and they can't scale it. At some point, you can get them involved when the risk is low, but while the risk is high, no big company can do it. And culturally, they don't reward risk taking. And hence, innovation, big companies, oxymorons together. That, um, so, and, and the other reality is you will have failure because people will want to kill technologies. That's not the first time it's happened. So unfortunate part of life is real life has some unpleasant things. You know, I don't like to see... Uh, an animal killed, but it's just part of life. So I'm sitting this way, and I want to make sure I don't short change over here. So right, right there, is that? Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm from Computer Science. So you'll be talking a little about being afraid. So I wanted to go a little deeper into this, uh, the nature of fear when you're trying to go forward with entrepreneurship. You'll have to speak up. Yeah. Somehow the acoustics are not set up to... You get sound around. from there, here. I guess okay. they're designed from here to there. Mes message sent, not message received, yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you were mentioning fear and being afraid of moving forward with different things. So I wanted to go deeper into this nature of fear and how to actually attack it. Uh, and I wanted to go at it at a specific example. So since you're related to energy, well, at least it says that over there. <laughs> um, how about, let's say, nuclear energy? Are we too afraid of it? It's supposed to be the most amazing technology that I personally have seen in terms of, you know, being able to produce that from a very small piece of materials. So what will be your thoughts on, on that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, you know, my favorite saying on fear is this, you know, people like to talk about courage uh, and especially courage of your convictions. I, talked about religion and passion about what you do. But the word courage is meaningless if you're not afraid. There is no courage without fear. If you have no fear of something, then it doesn't take courage to do it. Um, it's an essential part of risk-taking. If something was low risk, somebody would already have done it. If something is risky, then you have to have fear and you need courage. All I can say is certain people are inclined that way, some people aren't. One of the things I mentioned, the God gene earlier, I think, um, the God gene actually minimizes the perception of risk. So you need less courage to do something <laughs> by making you a little bit stupider about the real risks. And I often say if I if I knew all the risks in a startup, 
before I started, I'd mostly not start it, right? <laughs> and so uh, this sort of blissful ignorance, uh, premature confidence, arrogance, all these are essential ingredients of innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as sort of overcoming your fears. Um, the best way I've done it is I start in life not needing much, um, and I said, so I have very little to lose and a lot to gain, because if you don't have much, you, don't, you can't lose much. In fact, when I did my first startup, I said to one of my VC friends, I think uh, this country is great. It's a great deal where if we win, we win. If we lose, you lose because I'm not putting any money in. <laughs> Essentially, the only thing I had to lose when I did my first startup was my student loans. There was nothing else I could loan. And so, one phrasing it right and saying, what is the risk you're taking? You might risk, take a risk at a technology development and it may fail. But if you view it as failure, that's one way. If you view it at, as learning with somebody else's money, that's pretty good. You don't have to spend 250K of your parents' money, spend some venture capitalist money learning. And then if you sort of say, I'm better off in doing my next thing, uh, it becomes much easier to take the risk. Very good. Let me see right there if somebody can see where I'm pointing. I see hands. I don't see people, but there's the microphone. Yeah, OK. Hi, my name is Matt. I'm a first year. Uh, MBA student. Uh, my question is, entrepreneurs spend so much of their time championing their ideas and convincing the world that they have the next big thing. I was curious, um, but before it is, I was curious if you could maybe share your story of uh, Sun Microsystems, of that moment where you knew this was going to be the next big thing. Um, I like to say there's a huge difference and startups often confuse this, between strategy and tactics. Have, being obstinate about your vision is important. You're going to go change the world. And at Sun, we knew we wanted distributed computing to happen. And everybody told me, why don't you become a graphics terminal on deck wax as deck has disappeared, but that was the dominant computing environment, DEC and IBM, and building graphics terminals for them. That was the incremental approach, right? But we were very, very clear we wanted to do distributed computing. And we were, I would say, foolishly visionary. First, we made networking Ethernet standard on every sun we ever shipped. Nobody had ever done that in computing, but, right? But here's, here's the scary part. We wasted a lot of money. Every sun shipped early on had DES encryption because I imagined the security world as being important to networked and distributed computing. It was a bad idea because the world wasn't ready for security. So as though my strategic vision of needing DES encryption on every node was actually exactly right in 1982, Tactically implementing it wasn't. Uh, so it's important to be obstinate about your vision and strategy, but you have to be really flexible about your tactics and not get stuck up. Usually people who are visionary will not compromise that vision to be tactically effective. And the way to think about it is you can't get to your vision in one step. You need 20 steps along the way, and at each of these steps, you garner some resources. Now, people believe you, so you can do the next incremental thing. So you pretend to do little things, and sometimes off-course things. Like, we had a huge fight, and somebody eventually convinced me to take networking out of the sun and put what were then called VT100 RS-232 ports so it could be used as a time-sharing machine. That was the tactical compromise of my vision. But it got us enough revenue to get the next funding to do the next thing. And so 
being very, very flexible on tactics, but being obstinate about your vision is an important part. And that happened many, many times at Sun. And that's why I say you mm -hmm. discover your business plan, you don't make it. But your vision, you should be generally something you're passionate about happening. And you should be flexible about your vision a little bit, but, but generally, if you're too flexible with your vision, uh, you become too opportunistic and give up on the larger picture. That's great. Uh, yes, right here. Yeah, go ahead. I think the microphone's coming to you. My name is Harsh Mangle. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. And I've just taken the leap from the corporate world to being a student again uh, as an adjunct faculty. My question has to do with uh, coal energy and India and China. You made a very compelling, uh, presented a very compelling and stimulating point of view on trying to invent your own future. India and China are mushrooming or the use of coal and the result in pollution is mushrooming. What approach would you take if you had that problem? Well, well I'll tell you what we are attempting. Turns out when your economy is growing at 10% or 6% or 8% a year, its infrastructure is generally growing, fa uh, needs to grow faster. That means roads, buildings, construction. Um, so I've personally taken the approach and I'm often wrong, so let me uh, uh, start there, is to say all the expert opinion about taking CO2, separating it, and sequestering it is complete baloney. It is exactly the wrong thing to do. But if I can use the carbon dioxide effectively, carbon dioxide is bad. Calcium carbonate, which is probably this stone here, is one form of carbonate is good. So with the magic of electrochemistry, if you can turn CO2 into CO3, carbonate ions, then you actually have really valuable products. We just built a new building. 15% of the cement in our floors and walkways is all carbon captured as cement. Huh? So that's an example. That requires hard innovation in electrochemistry to make the CO2 to CO3 conversion cheap. And that generally means lowest energetic cost of producing an OH ion. I won't go too much into the detail. At the other end, it's taking carbonates and doing, finding nanostructures that increase their value. Whether it's as granite or marble or cement or something else. So that, when you ask fundamental questions, as opposed to read expert opinion and believe it, you come up with very different answers, I find. That's an example. Coal would then become economic because you'd be co-producing cement, and those economies need it. I'm looking at my handler, who is telling me, for reasons I will explain after the, in, in, in a second, that we... We must wrap up here in just one more question, I believe. So I have a concluding item after this question, but let me pick uh, somebody for the, last, uh, for the last question. I think that hand right there has been the most vociferous. Hey, um, my name is Mogan. I'm a chemical engineering major at Carnegie Mellon. You have um, to speak up. Talk up. Oh. Uh, I'm a chemical engineering major. That was it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so you talked a lot about um, yeah, not being certain and not and knowing that we don't know that much. What do you think in general about having the control about future events? And is that even a, no a notion that's like desirable, having the control about what happens? Yeah. So the question I'll repeat, as I understood it, is you have to control future events. And what do I think about it? Obviously, that's true at many, many levels. Um, the fundamental thing I would say is we focus too much on providing, reducing failure, which means increasing control and predictability. There's another way to make failure more acceptable, and that's to reduce the consequences of a failure. So let me give you an example. If I take a computer system and 
flip a chip or cut a wire, it will normally fail. If I cut my finger, my body keeps going. It's a resilient, error-prone system. It's tolerant to errors and mistakes and failures. By and large, I think because of our engineering mindset, we've done more of prevent failure stuff and less of reduce the consequences of failure so we can tolerate more failure. Um, I think at the social level, especially at complex systems, I think we should engineer for more failure but make it smaller. Uh, that's what I think. Um, to the extent control becomes in the electrical engineering world, a software problem, and all software is free, essentially, and mostly computing is free. Putting more power into control is a good thing. Um, let me end by saying one generalized comment. It relates to your question, but in a much more generalized way. The world economy is becoming more about ideas. The capitalist system was invented when labor was the principal way earning happened. If, if there's an economist, they'll be, ha they'll be happy to hear this, um, especially liberal economists. Um, if you got paid for your labor, you only had 8,000 hours of labor if you worked 100% of the time in a year. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I actually consider it's fortunate, the economy has moved to one driven by ideas. And so labor is no longer an important component of the economy. Ideas are. That's why innovation becomes important. That's why entrepreneurship becomes important. That's why I believe the power of ideas fueled by entrepreneurial energy is the single most important force in the world for good. And intellectual horsepower, learning, real learning, um, become really, really important in the fate of the planet. And you get phenomena like uh, Mark Zuckerberg can make $25 billion or whatever he's made, or Larry Page. Because multiplying ideas is easy. Multiplying a car physically 100 times costs 100 times as much, maybe 50 times as much because of scale economics and all that. But multiplying an idea doesn't take extra cost. And so ideas become disproportionately powerful tools and disproportionately more valuable. So as long as the economy moves to the power of ideas driven by innovation, we will see more asymmetry in economics. The disparity, what's called the Gini coefficient in economics, between the rich and the poor will keep going up. The poor won't be the people with the resources, it'll be people with ideas. So social mobility will hopefully increase. But it is a fundamental change in the structure of global economics and capitalism that we haven't included in the theory of economics. But innovation is the principal reason, and the power of ideas and intellectual ideas is what's driving this. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was really nice. That was really Thank good. you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank our, our guest. He has an extraordinarily busy schedule. He's going to be meeting with uh, uh, President Suresh in Philadelphia before a few, a couple more hours, and then I know you have a speaking com set of commitments in New York City. I have, but I we're, have a speaking engagement in Philadelphia at 2 o'clock. So we, we, are, we, we are doubly <laughs> grateful. And a dinner in New York City, we, so I apologize. We, I have we, to we, run. We are, we are so let, me, let me just say, anybody who has to communicate, I know people will have questions for me, Feel free to email me at vk at coastalventures.com. I'll be impolite and run. Uh, and remember, being impolite is important. Um, if, if, if people are interested in impolite, I gave a talk to a high school kids, a lot of Indian kids and Chinese kids in this high school. And I gave my talk 
about why they should not listen to their teachers, why they should throw food, color outside the lines. Um, it's on our website. I actually think it captures some really important ideas about behavior and, and what is acceptable and what you should do to challenge what's acceptable. And, 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 and let me say that for all of you who are liberal arts majors, please, we're gathering in the corner after this talk for the therapy sessions that will be required. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> that was great. Thank you.